good to have you all here with us. Um, if you would please take a moment to silence your phones while I make a couple of announcements. Um, in addition to this event, we're having a second reading tomorrow night with Tommy Pico in this room at 5 o'clock. Um, and this is all part of the Poem in Your Pocket celebration, part of National Poetry Month. Um, and you might have seen the poems that are floating around campus. If you grab one of those or have any poem that you want to put in your pocket and then go to the bookstore, at the bookstore you can check out and uh, read it to them and they'll give you 20% off of your purchases. So don't forget to do that. Um, also, next Tuesday, Keith Wilson is having his book launch. Um, Bill <laughs> Field Notes on Ordinary Love will be for sale first time, right? Um, in the Kenyon College Bookstore. Uh, uh, and Keith will read and answer questions and we will celebrate this moment with him. Uh, and that is at 7 o'clock in the bookstore on Tuesday. Um, but again, on behalf of the Kenyon Review, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we also want to thank the English Department and the GLCA for their role in making Chin's visit here possible. Chin Chin is the author of the Poulin Prize winning collection, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities, which was also long listed for the National Book Award and won the Tom Gunn Award. Blood Axe Books is also publishing a UK edition of this book in June of 2019. It was also this collection that led Chen Chen to receive the 2018 GLCA's New Writers Award in Poetry. The GLCA judges called this collection a mix of clever poetic premises and life's abiding promise. They go on to note this collection is by turns comic, dark, self-obsessed, playful, and restless. The poems move into and through and beyond a relationship with Chen's family, particularly his mother, exploring queer identity in the face of familial disapproval. There is clarity and unity of voice, employing simple language across poems that embody very different formal techniques in meditational, lyrical, and or elegiac modes. These poems are embracing of our human flaws while also turning to the positive connections we make in our lives. Chin Chin is also the author of four chapbooks, most recently, you Must Use the Word Smoothie, a craft essay in 50 writing prompts, which is forthcoming from Sundress Publications, spring of 2019, and Gazoon Type, in collaboration with Sam Herschel Wine, and forthcoming from Glass Poetry Press, fall of 2019. The recipient of fellowships from Kudimon and National Endowment for the Arts, Chin's work appears in publications such as Poem a Day, The Massachusetts Review, the Best American Poetry, and the Best American Non-Required Reading. He holds an MFA from Syracuse University and a PhD from Texas Tech University. He teaches at Brandeis University as their poet in residence and co-runs the journal Underblom. He lives in Waltham, Massachusetts with his partner Jeff Gilbert and their pug, Mr. Rupert Giles. Please join me in welcoming Chen Chen. so much for being here. Um, I need a cough drop in my mouth, so <laughs> that's why maybe it looks fuller. Um, <laughs> slightly. Um, so I've gotten really good at talking with a cough drop in my mouth. Um, <laughs> I've been getting over this bad cold uh, the last like, two weeks. Um, still have a bit of a cough and a sore throat. So I'm hoping um, to. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, for this reading, but bear with me. Um, yeah. I think the cold is in its, like, I don't want to say final stage because that sounds like death. <laughs> but I'm recovering. Uh, yeah, let's start with this new poem. Or newer poem. Um, it's always so funny to say new work because it's like I wrote this three years ago and then just <laughs> edited it. Um, yeah, I just 
tweaked the thing in this poem. Um, so I've been working on these poems that share titles uh, that are like the school of blah blah blah. So there's the school of joy, the school of logic. Um, there's a poem called the school of Australia. And um, I was just thinking about, uh, so in this poem, um, just some background, I was in this um, sociology class in undergrad and uh, one of the assignments was to interview someone uh, that we knew, that we were close to, and so I interviewed my father because I was really interested in learning more about his immigration story. Um, so he came to the U.S. Um, first, was um, in Texas for about a year before my mother and I followed, and I was about three at this time. And um, I learned in that interview that he was actually considering other places. I had never known this um, my whole life, so I was like 19, 20 by this point. Uh, and he said, actually I was thinking about going to Australia <laughs> at one point. And I thought, that's so interesting. Um, and so this poem is uh, kind of a fantasy of like, what if he had come to Australia? Uh, but I wanted to make it clear that it's a fantasy of Australia, not really Australia. Um, because Australia also has um, a lot of issues around uh, racism and southern colonialism and white supremacy. Um, and one of my favorite uh, YouTubers actually is um, Australian um, comedian Natalie Tran, you know, um, Community Channel, and she talks about some of these issues of anti Asian racism in Australia. Um, so in this poem, I'm calling it Australia Land <laughs> to be like, oh, it's better, maybe. Um, the School of Australia Land. Your emergency contact has called to quit. Your backup plan has backed away. Your boyfriend has joined a boy band named All Your Former Boyfriends in Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> in the ugly teapot, uglier luggage section of your local Dillard's, you would like to scream. Meanwhile, your father has decided to pursue his original dream and move to Australia land. There, he will study beach studies, and his Western name, Tony, will finally catch on. Tony, the people of Australia land will say, where have they been hiding you? And Tony will say, I never imagined I'd be doing way better than my son. <laughs> and on his way home from the school of the beach, its shells and endless glitter, Tony will toss out a dog-eared copy of the manual he received upon arriving in America. How to have deeply sorrowful exchanges with your son about your immigrant hardships. How to make him understand he must become a neurosurgeon, at least a dentist. The manual will go on to a second career, titling academic papers. Australia Land will be renamed Tony Sun, get your shit together. <laughs> T-S-G-Y-S-T will call to say, but remember, you're already a glittery stretch of dream. Your own emergency Tony. <laughs> um, I read a bit from this book, and then I'm going to turn to some of your work. So I'm going to set it. I'll just check on the time. This is called In the Hospital. My mother was in the hospital, and everyone wanted to be my friend. But I was busy making a list. Good dog, bad citizen, short skeleton, tall mocha. Typical Tuesday. My mother was in the hospital, and no one wanted to be her friend. Everyone wanted to be soft, cooing sympathies, very reasonable pigeons. No one had the time, and our solution to it was to buy shinier watches. We were enamored with what our wrists could declare. My mother was in the hospital, and I didn't want to be her friend. Typical son. Tall latte, short tail, black, bad plot, great Wi-Fi in the atypical cafe. My mother was in the hospital, and she didn't want to be her friend. She wanted to be the family grocery list, low-fat yogurt, firm tofu. She didn't trust my father to be it. You always forget something, she said, even when I do the list for you, even then. Self-portrait with and without. 
with dried cranberries, without a driver's license, with my mother's mother's worry, without, till recently, my father's glasses, with an A in English, a C in chemistry, with my mother saying, you have to be three times better than the white kids at everything, without a dog or cat, with a fish, with a fish I talked to before bed, telling him my ideas for new kinds of candy, with a tutor in Mandarin, with a 1986 low-budget live-action TV version of Journey to the West, with Monkey King's quest for redemption, Buddhism through Monster of the Week battle sequences, with thinking, I've grown up now because I regularly check the news in the morning, with the morning the children, spared or missed by the child with a gun, go back to school, make the same jokes they made three Mondays ago, but in a different voice, with the younger brother who is taller than I am, with the youngest brother who wants to go to art school, with my mother's multiplying worries, with my brothers, my brothers, with the cry of bats, with the salt of circumstance, without citizenship, with the white boy in ninth grade who called me ugly, without my father for a year because he had to move away to the one job he could find on the other side of the state, with his money transferred to my mother, with William Carlos Williams, with the local library, with yet another big sale for Honduras in Massachusetts suburbia, with the earthquake in my other country, with my mother's long distance calls, with my aunt's calls from China when the towers fell. How far are you from New York? How far are you from New York? With cities fueled by scars, with the footprint of a star, with the white boy I liked, with him calling me ugly, with my knees on the floor, with my hands begging for straighter teeth, lighter skin, blue eyes, green eyes, any eyes brighter other than mine. I mean, so large. I think I could live in it. <laughs> but I don't want to. Um, so this next one, we were talking about uh, the uh, future plans <laughs> during lunch. What are you going to do with your life? Um, um, so I wrote this poem during graduate school, maybe the second year. I was starting to think about jobs. <laughs> So this is called In This Economy. <laughs> People person seeks paid internship in liking you as a friend, respecting you as a coworker. Serial monogamous seeks change of pace in sledding it up for the summer. Animal lover seeks entry level position teaching guinea pigs how to swim. Solitude lover seeks more of the same. I want to be as beautiful as carrot cake as three firefighters shoveling out a fire hydrant after the snowstorm, as the whole city after storm. I am knowledgeable in advanced aftermath. I am proficient in scowling. Often I am a counterculture pistachio on casual Friday. In one pocket, chapstick. In the other, racist comments from people who claim to be post-racial or kind. If you'd like, I can alphabetize all my regrets but I'll have to start from H. I like a good multi-purpose room, also multi-purpose flower. I excel at pouring tea into the moon, a scary amount. I'm too much statuary and not enough city. I'm a collection of collectors. It's pretty okay. One of my collectors is collecting rust from radiators and belief from Quakers. I've befriended every shade of evening and they cannot recommend me highly enough. I hold degrees in both my hands, in my mouth. My sole weakness is being the chairperson of my own childhood, beloved president of ages three through seven. My weakness is hoarding phrases I overheard, didn't want to read. Now, even softer and more absorbent, our finest, the supermarket brand says, like from one family to another. I am a family of collectors. My father collects newspapers, like they're his own memories. We trip over stacks of them in the living room, groan when he quotes from them, all housing markets and cloud formations. Car prices are a specialty he whips out for dinner guests. My weakness is that I listen. My mother collects, you know, safe stamps, like they're her own children, but better. She can store them in a book, take them out when she wants, love them like they've just been born, 
and the labor, a breeze. No drugs, no doctor, just a pair of scissors, a bucket, warm water. All the wonderment of birth in under 20 minutes. The mother doesn't even have to be physically present. She can go check on her human kids while the water coaxes, releases the stamps from the remaining blocks of envelope. She returns and the bucket is a small aquarium of state birds and flowers, dead presidents and once popular singers. My, we my weakness is anything paper and anything miniature. My parents' friends' weakness is nautical paintings and antique clocks. My boyfriend's stepfather's weakness is vintage farm equipment and antique clocks. <laughs> I want them to meet. Perhaps I could be a liaison or something else French in this economy of acute magpie syndrome where just a hobby is the strongest industry and we work overtime at our reverie. My weakness is loving this economy. I want them to meet by only seeing my parents' friend at Thanksgiving. We'll be in the middle of Turkey and Mapo Tofu when all the old work clocks go off. No, not all. Some go off on time at 6, others at 6.01 and the last rebellious group, 603. <laughs> At first I think this is a deliberate, unsynchronized idiosyncrasy. But at the next Thanksgiving, when this occurs again, our host exclaims in his most New England Mandarin, oh dear, I thought I'd fix them. Sorry about that. Our clocks, besides, as though they belong to everyone at the table. Everyone. This is called um, <coughs> Nature Palm, which um, is based on nature. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling Nico has a little bit called Nature Palm. <clears throat> the birds insist on pecking the wooded dark. The wooded dark pecks back. It is time to show the universe what you're capable of says my horoscope, increasingly insistent this month. But what I'm capable of is staring at the salt accident on the coffee table and thinking, what sad salt. I admire my horoscope for its conviction. I envy its consistency. Every day, every day, there is a future to be aggressively vaguer about. <laughs> Earlier today, outside the cabin, the Sutton deer were a supreme headache of beauty. Don't they know I'm trying to be alone and at peace? In theory, I'm alone. Really, I'm hidden, which is a fine temporary substitute for peace, except I still have email, which is how I receive my horoscope. And even here in the wooded dark, I receive yet another email mistaking me for another Chen. I add this to a folder, which also includes emails sent to my address, but addressed to Chang, Chin, Chung. Once in a Starbucks, the cashier was convinced I was Chad. Once, in a Starbucks, the cashier did not quite finish the end on my chin, and when my tall mocha was ready, they called out for share. <laughs> I preferred this by far, but began to think, I'm a Starbucks. Why can't you see me? Why can't I stop needing you to see me? For someone who looks like you to look at me, even as the coffee accent is happening to my second favorite shirt. In my wooded dark, I try insisting on a supremely tall, never lonely someone. But every kind of someone needs someone else to insist with. I need, if not the you I've memorized and recited and mistaken for the universe, another you. So I'm going to get some new poems. I can find them. It's another one on my phone. Just taking this one as well, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so this one <coughs> is called The School of Your Book, uh, slash letter to Jennifer S. Chang, who's, um, a poet friend of mine. Um, this is a story about reading her second book, which is called Moon, uh, Maps, Letters, Poems. It's a really gorgeous book. Um, draws a lot on um, Chinese folklore and mythology. The School of Your Book. Three nights your book has held my childhood and nowhood in its peppermint boat, while a great many flutes were played, probably all by Bjork. <laughs> Not since my last bowl of chilled, honeyed, little tongue have I felt this care cared for. 
welcomed by the brightest, mooniest hello. Hello, my name is, no, I don't care. Guy from acquaintances, college days. Stop your resume declaiming, vacation monologuing, stop. Out at a people chatting last night, and all I wanted was Totoro's cat bus to take me back, <laughs> back into these cages a fourth night. How could I have forgotten the beautifully rude option of just bringing your book along? <laughs> Once I brought a book to a boyfriend's, friend's, birthday, new job, going away party. <laughs> Afterward, the boyfriend said, you barely talk to anyone. And I said, but I had the best conversation. I think you get it. Every time we speak in person, we speak for hours about the honeyed ocean of not speaking to people. Does it also take you three whole days to recover with snacks and Totoro and blissfully portable portal every time? And then this one, um, which I wrote much later, but I'm kind of thinking, as, thinking of as this companion piece. Uh, so my friend Sam was mentioned in the intro, um, gave me this prompt to try to write as the opposite of myself. So this is called uh, Self-Portrait as, as a Wild Extrovert. Um, it's kind of based on him, actually. Some of those extroverted friend. Self-Portrait as, self as a Wild Extrovert. I have 600 dear friends. I hug each of them daily. I never need a mint, but I'm always ready to offer one or 600. I love and know a lot about biking slash speaking. I love and know a lot about Celine Dion, thanks to my mom, who is, if I absolutely had to pick one, but who am I kidding? Of course, she's my best friend. Once every five years, I might feel a smidge of sadness. And when I do, I just sit down, maintaining impeccable, approachable posture. <laughs> I breathe. I breathe like the very well-organized, very wallless workspace I've run since birth. I breathe like breathing is my oldest dear friend named Daphne Daphne, whom I still call every night before bed to say, you are an incandescent multiverse. Don't you forget it. Nothing <laughs> fails to do the trick. So. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could be like that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, the energy. Let me sweep two more. So this one is also newer. Um, it's called the School of Song, Uno, and Dinner Time. Uh, so I started writing this uh, when I was living in Lubbock in West Texas. I didn't realize how much I would miss. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, and I knew that uh, culturally, socially, in some ways, it would be very different. Um, so I was like, mentally preparing for that. But I didn't realize how much I would miss landscape. Um, and in West Texas, if you've never been, it's very flat, um, kind of dusty plains. The sky is huge. It's beautiful. Um, it's a different kind of beautiful. Um, I just found myself really missing um, trees and hills. <laughs> so that comes into this poem, part of it. The School of Song, Uno, and Dinner Time. My song is snow in March and May. My song is 80 degrees the next day. My song is, I couldn't decide what to get you, so here, everything. My song, the sky over Amherst, Massachusetts. My song goes, happy birthday, Emily Dickinson. My song goes on field trips to Emily's house and books and dress and funky gift shop and tour guides who once worked for the post office and now work for her light. My song wants to stand as tall, as brave as a former postal worker standing in the middle of Emily's room and singing, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. But tonight in Lubbock, my song is a different selection. My song wants to open the glass sliding door of the kitchen of my parents' house outside Boston, where we moved 
where they must be now, this November night, in the middle of making soup with fish balls and fried rice with leftover everything. My song can hear my parents, their shoulders bumping as they work the stove, every burner on, Friday night dinner. My song hears my two brothers, home from college, sliding slipper-footed into the kitchen and hungry. My song wants to say, I know I haven't called. Say, I'm still angry, but should call. My song wants my brothers to know, I'm still angry, but not with you. You, who last December gave me the gift of a shrug, of saying, that's great, when I told you about the man I love. My song is the way we jumped right back to a brutal round of Uno, and I was too bowled over by the two of you to even try saving myself. My song was, for years, dads never tell anyone else in the family, moms never tell your brothers. My song was one long note of never, the door shut before I could select all of my society. My song was the way I believed you, my brothers, wouldn't select me. My song was still angry, angry but. Would you believe it now that I miss them too? How tonight I can't stop hearing their shoulders bumping, their hands placing bowl after sizzling bowl of garlicky light on the kitchen table, their shoulders bumping as one of them squeezes past the other, hurries from the kitchen to the foot of the stairs and calls her down for dinner. You know, come on while it's still hot. They're calling you by name, by full, it's dinner time, name. They're shouting for you, not a song, more like a cry. In this last poem I read, um, came about actually because I had a conversation with a friend of mine, poet um, Meryl Leon, um, about that poem. I just read an earlier version of it. Um, and she said, what if you tried writing something where <coughs> um, the parents and home have to come to you, or the speaker, um, <laughs> and they kind of have to be on your turf, so to speak. And I was like, oh, I've never thought about that. <laughs> um, so I was just really glad for her suggestion and her um, question about that poem. Um, so Home Alone, do we all remember this cinematic masterpiece? <laughs> um, just a classic tale of um, botched burglary and family abandonment. Um, <laughs> really heartwarming and really gory too. Like, how do they survive the house? Um, so there's a scene in it, right, um, where uh, because the burglars are targeting the houses of people who have uh, left on vacation for uh, Christmas, um, or leading up to Christmas, and um, so the kid has to make it seem like there are people still at home, <laughs> and it's really elaborate. Um, like rewatching this as an adult, I was like, why didn't he just like? order food or like have someone come over or like leave the TV on. <laughs> but it's really incredible, really resourceful. Um, <laughs> he does. Um, so that's sort of when referencing that particular story. <laughs> but I'm also thinking about how um, in the first part of the movie he's just really happy that his family's gone. Right? <laughs> it's like my giant annoying family is finally gone and I get the house to myself. And it's only through like attacking the burglars that he like learns. Oh my god, I miss my family. Um, so this is called, I invite my parents to a dinner party. In the invitation, I tell them for the 17th time, the fourth in writing, that I'm gay. In the invitation, I include a picture of my boyfriend and write, you've met him two times. But this time, you will ask him things other than, can you pass the whatever? You will ask him about him. You will enjoy dinner. You will be enjoyable. Please RSVP. <laughs> they RSVP. They come. They sit at the table and ask my boyfriend the first of the conversation starters I slip them upon arrival. How is work going? And like the kid in Home Alone, orchestrating every movement of a proper family, 
as if a pair of scary yet deeply incompetent burglars is watching from the outside. My boyfriend responds in his chipper way. I pass my father a bowl of fishball soup. So comforting, isn't it? My mother smiles her best, sitting with her son's boyfriend, who is a boy, smile. I smile <laughs> my hooray for doing a little better, smile. Everyone eats soup. Then my mother turns to me, whispers in Mandarin, is he coming with you for Thanksgiving? My good friend is, and she went like this. I'm like the kid in Home Alone, pulling on the string that, more, that makes my cardboard mother more motherly, except she is not cardboard. She is already exceedingly my mother, waiting for my answer. While my father opens up a Boston Globe, when the invitation clearly stated, no security blankets. <laughs> I'm like the kid in Home Alone, except the home is my apartment, and I'm much older, and not alone, and not the one who needs to learn, has to. Remind me what's in that recipe again, my boyfriend says to my mother, as though they have always easily talked, as though no one has told him many times what a non-linear slash stick means, slasher flick means, psychological pip he is now co-starring in. Remind me, he says, to our family. Thank you so much. Chen has agreed to take some questions. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, thank you so much. That was such a great reading. Um, you absolutely shattered my heart a couple times, and sort of rather than dealing with the repercussions of that emotionally, I'm going to be a good Midwesterner and ask you about process. Um, but so, why, why keep the poems so playful when they're eventually going to get into emotional tumult like the end of the last one that you just read? Can you speak a little bit to the, the value of mm -hmm. playfulness when we're going to get into very dark and thorny and personal territory? That's a great question. I think part of it is I don't want you to see it coming. Um, Good job. <laughs> so I want there to be that surprise. Um, but I also know I can't pull that exact move too many times. Um, so I've been thinking lately about um, how, if yeah, if it would be possible to invert that structure, um, to start a poem with something devastating, and then for it to be funny. <laughs> um, I haven't figured that out yet, um, but that would be interesting. Um, or just the timing, right, um, of how does something get revealed, or how does something unfold. Um, but I think from my process, like from that perspective, as a writer, um, I just, you know, it can just be so daunting to write about um, something really vulnerable or something so personal. And so in a way, for me, the humor is also um, this way of um, starting from a smaller place mm -hmm. um, or a calmer place um, and then writing my way toward um, the scarier thing, or the true subject of the poem. Um, and, I mean, hopefully, I mean, the humor is also a way to engage, right, rather than um, escape. But I think it can be this protective layer, um, like an armor, um, going into the poem. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. How do you approach like writing about like people who are so close in your life mm -hmm. with like your family and your partner while also knowing that like there's a chance they would see it? Because there's a way of, like sometimes yeah. writing feels like no one will ever see it. Mm -hmm. Um so the silly answer that I'll give <laughs> um, is uh, my parents aren't that great with the internet. So they can't like find everything. <laughs> Um, so I have like a buffer <laughs> for like, some time if I were going to have a conversation with them about something or realize that. Um, but um, many of the things I write about um, have happened like years and years ago. 
um, or at least a couple. Um, and so there's been time in which like, I've processed it, um, they've processed it, we've processed it together. Um, it's like a funny song, <laughs> we've processed it together. Um, <laughs> we all scream for ice cream. Um, but yeah, so there's distance, right? Um, so there's a like personal distance, there's a critical distance as a writer. I think that's really important. Because um, sometimes I'll want to write about something right away, um, but I feel like, yeah, I usually end up stepping back anyway um, and needing to put the piece aside. So I might write the first draft of something um, soon after um, an occurrence or a conversation, an interaction, um, but then I'll put it away for a while and then come back to it. Um, Cause yeah, I just I don't think that I was just um, did this event um, last night in Boston, and one of the other um, readers, poet Javier Zamora, um, was saying, you know, poems are not enough. Um, you should go to therapy. <laughs> um, you know, talk, um, and you know, take care of yourself, um, and not um, kind of. Uh, damage or re-traumatize yourself um, in writing about something so vulnerable. Um, so I think that's a really important um, issue. Um, and then, I don't know if there's something else I'm going to say at that point, but then we'll come back to it. Here's that question. Mm-hmm. Um. I forgot the intake, by the way. Oh, that's um, okay. Over. Um, but um, how did you know you wanted to get into poetry? Mm. Just because, like, I read the first book, and it just, like, I was, like, oh, clearly been doing this for a long, long time, and then, like, it was, like, your first book. Um, oh, thank yeah. you. Um, I always like telling stories. Um, I used to want to write for TV, actually. I still watch an obscene amount of television. <laughs> <laughs> Not good for me. Um, because it's not all, like, good television. <laughs> um, but I always say, you know, it's important to, um, engage with things as a poet, right? So, to make mac and cheese as a poet, to watch reality TV as a poet, to walk around and look at trees as a poet, right? Um, so that's how I try to <laughs> justify it, maybe. Um, but yeah, I started out... Um, writing more stories, um, long stories. I just love the um, serial storytelling format of television, where you can follow a character or a um, whole group of characters um, for multiple seasons, and each season can tackle different things, have a different theme, have a different big bad, right? Um, so like Buffy the Vampire Slayer was a really big influence for a while. Um, I think it still is. Um, <laughs> also dialogue. Um, and how you pay attention to conversation and the way different people talk. Um, so that was an early influence, and I would um, <coughs> also write these um, skits and make uh, my friends, um, or they would volunteer, to um, <laughs> act out different parts um, on the playground. And then they all sort of uh, graduated. They went on to like real games, <laughs> and I was like, I don't care about those. Um, so I stayed in, in the imaginary game realm. Um, and then, yeah, poetry, it really started to read more of it um, in high school. Um, it was in Newton, and we have a really great um, local library, great poetry section. It's really lucky to have that. And I just check out all these books and have really encouraging English teachers. And then took a poetry workshop <coughs> in college um, with um, Martina Spada. And that just like changed things, and I just completely fell in love with the form, and just how you could compress so much, and give this whole world um, in a page or two. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank you. Thank you.